This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision making for Canadians. We're hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore. And we're still working from home. Yeah. You know, I feel funny whenever I say the four Canadians piece, because as much as it is primarily for Canadians and the data, the data of our listenership show that it, there's, there's an increasing, ever increasing contingent of non-Canadian listeners. And I've said this before, but everyone is welcome. It's not for, just for Canadians. Yeah, but it's no wonder. I mean, last week, <laughs> Professor Ken French was so good. He got picked up and retweeted by lots of people all around the world. You can see why it's starting to get broad appeal. Yeah. I mean, the, the last few months might be tough to match, though, between Cliff and Ken. Um, but we'll do it. We've got some great guests coming up, too. For sure. So let's talk about the discussion board. See, so you, you've kind of retooled the Rational Reminder website, and the discussion board is in there. Yeah. So, I, I mean, it's not a discussion board makes it sound way fancier than it is. <laughs> we, we installed uh, an app installed that that's that's an exaggeration too uh we started using an app called commento uh which seems great and it, it's it's really designed for commenting on you know individual posts and so every podcast episode now you, you can go comment as, as you could before but it's just it, it looks better now and you can sort by upvoted comments and uh, or the newest comments um, and it's all threaded discussion so it it, it so far has been great um, we were able to port all of our old comments from, uh, our, our website over, but the only downside is that they came over without names. So they're all just anonymous comments, but whatever, you can still see the old, old discussion. Some of the old posts had a whole bunch of comments on them. Well, we'd be able to see, we had one question from a listener asking if you'll be able to find based on a certain topic. No, right. That's, so that's, that's why I'm saying that a discussion board is a bit of an exaggeration. So I, I created a page on our website that's just called discussion. And it's basically just one big comment thread. Now there, there, you can post a top level comment and then people can discuss underneath that. That's the benefit of it being threaded, I guess. Um, but there's no way to sort by thread or anything like that. So over time, I, it, it'll become, um, I don't know. A mess isn't the right word because I think there's a lot of valuable discussion going on already, but it might become hard to organize. So I don't know. We'll deal with that in the future. For now, I think that the platform is working really well and it's facilitating a lot of really good discussion on, on the website. Yeah. And as far as discussion goes, we're also kicking around the idea of having other advisors on our team jump in the, the board and start answering questions so people can get to know them as well. So I think that's a pretty cool idea. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we, we will do that. Um, the, the, the client facing advisors that we have on our team are going to start participating in, in the discussion. So that should, should, I, I don't know, add some element of, um, some, some good elements to the discussion, but something that I've been really impressed with so far. And I said, I say this in the little intro blurb on the discussion page, um, like to feel, feel free to answer other people's questions. And it's been happening, which is cool. Mm -hmm. Like people are posting questions and other people are yeah. answering them and it's awesome. Uh, I'm participating when I have time, but I'm not anywhere close to answering every question. And I don't think that I ever will be that close to that because there are a lot of questions going up every day. So there's two other questions we had. When will the new model portfolios be up? Yeah, that, <laughs> I've been getting that question a lot for a long time. So I've, I've, I put quite a bit of time into that dollar cost averaging paper because I wanted to do it well, or that paper. I haven't, we haven't introduced yet. In, in this episode, we talk about a paper on dollar cost averaging that I've just mostly finished probably, I think. Um, maybe a <laughs> couple more revisions, I don't know. But we talked about that paper. Uh, so I've, I spent a lot of time on that recently. The next one is going to be the new model portfolios, but I'm not just, just going to make new model portfolios. I've got to do a paper to explain why I'm doing them the way that I am, but they are going to be quite a bit different from the ones uh, that we released last time. And so the paper will explain why they're different. Target date, roughly? Oh, geez. Um, I'm going to say from now, so this is coming out on Thursday. Um, so it'll be a, by the next episode of just uh, of us. So it'll be this so, episode on Thursday, a so guest, and then June. us again. I think I'll be able to at least at least talk about the paper, even if it's not quite ready to be published 
on that next episode. So two so weeks. June, June 18th, 20th. Okay. And then the other thing we are working on is to get a book list. We've had a few people ask about getting a book list on the, the site. We have it. Um, I, I don't actually know what we're waiting for. Um, okay. We so work with a third person on our, on our PWL team named Angelica on a lot of the podcast stuff behind the scenes. Uh, so we'll ask her. But yes, okay. we have a book list and it, it references the episode that the book was mentioned in and it's a pretty cool it's a pretty cool list. We have it. I, I yeah. It just needs to get posted. Cool. So good episode. Again, a lot on the dollar cost averaging. Some planning topic, of course. The other we're regular stuff. Re we're not gonna review all the items because someone told us not to do that. Exactly. So with that, we hope you enjoy episode one oh one. Welcome to episode 101 of the Rational Reminder Podcast. So I have a couple of books I suggest people take a look at ahead of upcoming guests. So one is Brian Portnoy's book, Geometry of Wealth. He'll be on next week with us. Fabulous book. I, I, I loved it. And I think you'll get a lot out of the conversation. He does go through the book, but if you have a chance to read it ahead of next week, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, he, he lays out the... The whole concept of managing money in a way that's, I don't know, different than what I've seen before. Yeah, I agree. And the second book that I suggest you take a look at is Fred Vitisse's book called The Essential Retirement Guide. He'll be on, I believe, in a month, probably four or six weeks out. And that's another excellent book, a little more technical on retirement planning, but a, a good book. And that one's also available on, on your Kindle, if you like. So did you listen to uh, Toby Ludke's interview last week on Invest Like the Best? Yeah, I did. It's fantastic. Fantastic interview. And so it's uh, Invest Like the Best with Patrick O'Shaughnessy. And I thought it was a phenomenal interview. And, and the part that really made high impact on me was where he talked about quality and how growing up in Germany quality was so high and you get so used to it, it became just part of your life. But then he linked that to the fact that US and China have lower quality standards, they can get products to market faster, which means their economies grew faster. So fascinating. Yeah. Did you have any more thoughts on that podcast episode? Oh, I have lots of thoughts on it. I thought it was a really interesting uh, episode. How about you? Well, I, the, one of my big takeaways was the quality piece that you just that you just mentioned. You can kind of relate that back to stuff like doing doing a podcast like this, where it would be very easy to, um, well, to not do it in fear of not every every episode not being perfect. But the fact that we're we're okay with um, not necessarily perfection in every single episode. Like there have been times we've had go to, had, had to go back and maybe not necessarily correct something factual, but go back and change our minds about something that we talked about in a recent episode because we've learned new information. It's the same, same kind of concept. Another thing that, that he impacted me with was because he is a prolific reader and he's talked about that on a number of podcasts. So books he's recommended have been added to my own reading list. And one of them that Patrick talked about, a book that he had read that I've never heard of before, which is the... Uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Have you read that book yet? I'd never no. even heard of it before, but I guess it, it's a classic. And I've had a number of, of friends that I've talked to about it said, oh yeah, I read it like 30 years ago. And it's interesting how Toby's point was just read, just read. You'll learn about yourself. You'll, you'll make your own framework of thinking out of it. Doesn't mean any book is necessarily right or wrong, but it'll affect how you think about the world. The main thing is just keep learning reading, listening to podcasts to get your own, your, your own belief system. So I just started reading this book and it's, it's a really interesting book and it actually, it came up in the discussion around quality. And that's what this book talks about is, you know, classic motorcycles have great qualities to them, but it's a story of these people that go across the Western USA and how they view the world and quality differently. So I'm only about a third of the way through, but it's a really interesting uh, read and it's far more complicated, I'm sure, than I'm realizing. So I think I'm either going to slow down or maybe go back and restart it because it is 
it's a very thoughtful book. It's one of the things Shane, Shane Parrish says in his guide to reading. I think he has a post on Farm Street about that. I think he has a course about it too. Well, maybe they canceled the course. Anyway, one of the things he says to do is to, um, to, to mark places that you want to revisit in the book. And once you've read it, put it away for a bit and then go back and read it again. And it kind of speaks to what you just said, is that the, the, the second time you go and pick it up, you are a different person, mm -hmm. having had read the book once. Mm -hmm. And so you may appreciate the things that you highlighted the first time more. And I'm actually finding that too about different podcasts. I've, I started to curate a list of my favorite episodes and I'm taking notes and I'm actually going back and re-listening to, to different episodes again, because there, there's such amazing quality in podcasts that are out there now, depending on what stage you're at in your life, your business. Oh, it's tons of content. Tons of content. Uh, on to current topics. Yep. So number one, I just saw this today, actually, changes to the CDIC rules, the Canada Deposit Insurance Corporation. Don't know if you'd heard these rules yet or not, but foreign currency deposits are now protected. Same limits, up to $100,000 of principal and interest per depositor, and it combined, gets combined with your other Canadian dollar deposits. And the other thing that was added is that term deposits of longer than five years are also now covered. Oh, wow. Yeah. Even if they were purchased before April 30th. So one of the questions that I saw on a, on a chat group was whether or not um, um, the limit would be raised. So there's some discussion around whether the $100,000 protection limit would be raised because that limit was set 15 years ago. So apparently I, I, some committee has been given power to increase that limit. Haven't been able to get the details on that, but for now it still is $100,000 per entity. That's kind of neat. A couple of big changes. Yeah, no, the, the, the foreign currency deposits, is uh, that's good. That's good news. I mean, it's all good news, but that one strikes me as particularly good. So the next point I, I picked up was our friend Michael Kitsis, who's a prolific um, commentator on our industry in the U.S. and hopefully will be a, a guest on an upcoming episode. He put out a chart showing average daily trade volume by clients at TD Ameritrade. And you talk about a hockey stick chart. This thing is crazy. So he showed the average number of trades up to the date when trading became free, which was late 2019. So on average, they were doing 800,000 to a million trades per day. Once they went free, trades quickly went up to 3 million trades per day. Wow. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, that is. Even though it was near free before, it was like a few dollars before, probably 5 or $10 per trade beforehand. And the last article was the article in the Globe about the Bank of Canada says downward pressure on inflation likely once the shutdown ends. And this is a question, I don't know about you, but I'm getting quite a bit where many people are in the camp that all this stimulus has to lead to inflation. And this article suggests that's not necessarily the case. Bank of Canada has a target inflation rate of 2% and they've slashed their key interest rates already three times to 0.25%. And inflation rate actually turned negative in April for the first time in almost a decade. I don't know, do you get that question as well? Yeah, well, this is one of the reasons that I wanted to get, a, and I still want to get a, a, a proper economist, monetary economist, I guess, on the podcast to talk about the monetary and fiscal policy response to the, um, to the current situation. Because, yeah, I am getting that question. On, on both sides, on the inflation side, um, from, I guess, the fiscal st stimulus more so, and then, well, I don't know if people fully understand the difference in either case. I think there's a lot of confusion about expected inflation as it relates to um, quantitative easing and also as it relates to fiscal uh, stimulus, but both on the inflation side and also on the asset pricing side. Like the the, <laughs> the comment that I see almost every day uh, online is uh, about how, how money printing is, is propping up asset prices. And in, in some ways, it kind of is. I don't know. This is something that I, I was doing a bunch of research on it for a while, and I kind of burned myself out on the topic. Um, but I'll come back to it, and we'll talk about it in more detail in the podcast at some point. But with quantitative easing, um, the central bank is trying to put downward pressure on longer-term interest rates. And <laughs> they kind of do that by printing money 
I mean, they do, but it's not in the way that people think. It's not, they're not making money out of thin air. Economists refer to that, I think, as helicopter money, where they're actually like dropping cash out of the helicopters into the streets. Mm-hmm. Um, but in reality, like the Federal Reserve is doing it by creating bank reserves and then swapping those bank reserves with fixed income instruments that financial institutions held. So it's really just affecting the term structure of financial assets in the private sector. Right. It's not actually dumping cash into the economy. So the right. idea that you're going to get inflation from that doesn't, doesn't make any sense. Inflation comes from um, lending. Like if, and inflation comes from lending, but lending does not come from low interest rates or cash surpluses. Lending comes from credit worthy people who are willing to borrow. And, and there are productive right uses now. for the cash. Yeah, well, same, yeah, same, same concept. Credit worthy people who are, who have a good reason to borrow. That 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 would drive inflation, but without that, um, yeah. And the other piece of that is that banks don't lend out, can't lend out bank reserves. Like that's not how the banking system works. So you're in working US, on a, you're working on a paper that? for this. Or are you working on a, a YouTube? Video. I don't know what it was. I was working on just research on it, maybe for the podcast, maybe for, I, I think I want to do a video on it eventually, but it's a big topic and central banks are different around the world too. Like the federal reserve operates a little bit differently from the bank of Canada. So distilling it all down into sort of concise information is, is not so easy, but we'll bring that back eventually. All right. So let's go on to rapid fire questions. So for, uh, let's do it. So first question for you, how do leveraged ETFs compare to borrowing to invest in traditional ETFs? We talked about this in a past episode. I can't remember which one. I should have written the number down. Um, I also did a YouTube video where I mentioned this pretty extensively. Um, the the big, biggest difference is the decay that leveraged ETFs are going to give you in volatile markets. And I'll describe a little bit more about what that is in a second. Um, with leverage ETF over any single tra- trading day, you expect to earn the, the multiple, whatever it is, 2x, 3x. I think I saw something about 4x, which is pretty crazy, uh, <laughs> of, the, of, of the underlying asset. Uh, so if the index goes up 5% um, on that day, you should get 10% on that day. Now, it's also important to note these instruments are specifically designed for daily replication. Like it's plastered all over the marketing material and, and websites for all of these products. Like these are designed to replicate the daily returns of the index, not necessarily the long-term um, returns. So that the challenge and where the decay concept comes from uh, is that the fund has to reset its leverage at the end of each trading day. So if you think about a 2X leverage S&P 500 ETF with uh, 100 million in assets, um, it, it would do something like take 80 million, uh, of its assets, invest in the S and P 500 and use the remaining 20 million to enter into derivatives, futures, um, maybe swap agreements to get the other 120 million of exposure to the index. So now it's got hundred million of assets, 200 million, um, net exposure to the index. So that gives you your two X return, obviously. Uh, so if we say the S and P 500 got a 5% return, the fund's going to gain $10 million. So obviously 10 million on a hundred million, you're getting your two X return, 10% relative to the 5% index return. Now the problem comes in the next trading day. So the fund's now got 110 million in assets, but it's a two X leveraged fund. So if it's got 110 million assets, but only 200 million exposure or 210, I guess, um, it's no longer two X leveraged. So it has to go re-up on its uh, leverage exposure to get back to 2x. Um, so when you own this fund, when stocks go up, you're being forced effectively to buy more stocks. And when they go down, you're being forced to sell stocks to keep the product on balance to its target exposure, to its target daily exposure to the index. Um, when markets are volatile, this is particularly detrimental. And I mentioned the word, but it's known as decay. And I found a paper when I did the YouTube video on this. Um, it was a 2010 paper in, in, in the Journal of the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. You found this. You can this. tell it was a, what's that? You found this. 
Well, I mean, when you search for, yeah, <laughs> it's Google. Come on. Uh, but, but you could, as you may expect, it, it was a fairly mathematically dense uh, paper. Anyway, the paper is titled Path Dependence of Leveraged ETF Returns. And they actually f- come up with a mathematical formula, which they verify empirically to show the theoretical relationship uh, between volatility and decay. So how much you would expect to lose relative to uh, the asset, to the underlying asset in, in decay. Um, so the, the main takeaway, and the, I guess the short answer to this question, uh, is that there's this time decay associated with the realized variance in the returns of the underlying asset. Now, it is important to note, and I think Dave uh, Nadig, who we had in the podcast, I don't know if he said this in the podcast or it was in an article that I read, um, but that concept of decay can actually work in your favor too. Like if the market just keeps going up, um, it can work out positively. It's really when you've got volatility that you start to get a real negative impact from the decay. Um, yeah. So I guess uh, an easy way to think about it is that when you have a leveraged ETF, as opposed to, I guess what you'd call homemade leverage, you have leverage exposure to the underlying asset. You have that daily leverage exposure. Uh, but you also have negative exposure to the variance in returns of the underlying asset. So if you end up with a very high variance asset, some like an oil, triple leveraged oil type thing, yep. relative to the underlying, you'd expect your returns to be lower. So anyway, that that time decay is the that that's the the big reason that you might not want to use this, use, use uh, these things. And actually, there was another from the from that when I did the research for that video. There was another. There was a paper from um, the people at AQR, and they talked about uh, products with built-in leverage actually have a a premium priced into them, um, which comes out as lower expected returns for the convenience of having built-in leverage. So that was another interesting point that can reduce the expected returns of products with built-in leverage as opposed to doing the leverage yourself. So time decay, potentially lower expected returns because of the leverage convenience premium, I guess. Anything else to add? Mm, nope. Okay, I'll give you the next one here. In episode 64, you mentioned that when you add the value tilt to a small cap index, you revive the factor. But haven't size and value been established as independent risk factors? Yeah, this is an interesting one. So no, I mean size size hasn't really been established as an independent risk factor, which some people may be surprised to hear. Um, there's no real good theoretical basis for a standalone size premium. I'd say it's weak at best. Uh, and in terms of st- statistical reliability, uh, it hasn't been really close. I mean, somewhat close, closer than something random, I guess. Um, but the T-stats have not been nearly as high as something like value or the equity risk premium in the historical data. So theoretically weak, empirically not as strong, not weak necessarily, uh, although over some time periods it is. Um, th- there's a really good paper from AQR that digs into a whole bunch of these well, facts facts and fictions. It's called Fact Fiction and the Size Effect. Uh, so they, they go into a, into a lot of this. One of the really interesting takeaways from that paper is that uh, Rolf Bond's, his 1981 paper, I can't remember the title, but that was the original Size Effect paper, and that ties into Dimensional's story as well, as we've probably talked about in past episodes. Um, when you go and repeat bonds research you don't actually get a statistically significant size premium over the time period that he initially looked at which is fascinating to think about Uh, and the reason uh, this is a a suggestion from the aqr paper the reason they think is that crisp the center for research and securities prices they're always making their database better Uh, and there's a guy named shumway that's his last name i can't remember his first name Um, he did a paper in 1997 and detailed the process that he went through to correct the delisting bias that had previously existed in the CRISP database. Mm -hmm. So that's 1997 and Bonds did his paper in 1981. That delisting bias mostly affected small companies and the delistings were mostly related to negative events. So Shumway went and manually dug up like what happened to this company 
um, and, and, and filled in all of those blanks. And filling in those blanks made small companies look worse on average. So hmm. anyway, when, when you correct for that and go back and look at the data, the, the original size premium paper wouldn't be like publishable today, which is crazy to think about. But wouldn't one theoretical basis for a small cap premium be cost of capital theoretically should be higher for a smaller company? Uh, yeah, I can, I can see that argument, but I think that the counter argument is that when you control for other things like relative price, well, the other factors that we know about relative price, profitability, quality, yeah. um, sure quality, when you control for all of those other things, um, the cost of capital should be accounted for in the other that. factors, the other factors have more power than the small cap factor. Yeah. I mean, well, yeah. The cost of capital argument still makes a lot of sense. And the theoretical models don't include, like the theoretical asset pricing models that Fulman French use, which I'll, I'll mention in a sec. They don't include size. Um, but I'll but I'll just I'll talk about it now. So in, in the Fulman French's 2013 paper, a five-factor asset pricing model, they explain the theoretical valuation equation that helped them arrive at their five-factor asset pricing model which does not include size, like I mentioned. And they address this, sort of. Um, they say if variables not explicitly linked to this decomposition, this decomposition being the theoretical valuation equation, such as size and momentum, help forecast returns. And here's the important part. They must do so by implicitly improving forecasts of profitability and investment or by capturing horizon effects in the term structure of expected returns. So I don't know. Maybe that means what you said. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not going to pretend to fully understand it. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think there's other stuff too. Like uh, one of the big ones on the cost cost of capital piece, and I'm trying re trying to remember this accurately from the AQR paper, uh, but it was something along the lines of there, there's a, a a liquidity premium that you'd expect in small stocks, which could increase their um, their cost of capital. Um, but then Cliff, I think it was Cliff that wrote the paper, um, says, or I guess him and, and the co-authors say that if, if there's a liquidity premium, that's a liquidity premium. It's not a size premium. There's some, I, 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 I got my head into some other research recently too, just looking at the value, the, the value premium and it's, it's persistence. Um, and in, in doing that research, th there's a bunch of, there's a whole body of, of work on the lack of a relationship between a company's actual cost of capital and its expected returns. Fama and the French have done work on this, or they've mentioned it repeatedly in papers, and some other people have actually done explicit research specifically on that topic. I was talking to our, our director of research, Raymond, about this, um, and that was one of the things we were talking about was this relationship between cost of capital and expected returns in the literature that's actually not a very strong link so maybe that answers your question, Cameron. Interesting. I think that answers that question. You think so? Not very, we're not very rapid, but we're firing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next one. Okay, this one's for you. We'll see. Uh, okay, the question is, I'm curious what you think about a 100% small cap value investment strategy for somebody with a long 30 plus year investment horizon. Uh, if I truly believe in the risk factors and if I'm an unemotional investor, wouldn't that be the sensible thing to do, at least for the U.S. portion? So this is a question that we we had Larry Suedro speak to clients a number of times, and he always talked about this. He called his barbell portfolio, and I see all over Reddit and other places, uh, Bogleheads, he calls it the Larry Suedro portfolio. And actually it showed up, I Googled it, it showed up on a website this week called Portfolio Einstein this most recent portfolio. And it, it's exactly that. And he actually told us this is what he does. He has a big slug of his portfolio in, in bonds. And a large part at that point was in bonds. But then the rest was all at the other end of the portfolio, which was largely US small cap value. So I looked on this site portfolio Einstein and it showed his current portfolio, well, the current Larry portfolio, not his, but current Larry Sweater portfolio is 15% U.S. large cap value, 15 small cap value, 13 U.S. small cap, 
4% emerging markets, 13% international large cap value, and 40% tips. Given what we just talked about, about small caps, it's interesting that there's a big allocation to small caps. Well, exactly. It's somewhat, uh, somewhat conflicted, but this is something that he, he did talk about every time we saw him. Oh, I guess it's, uh, as value know, it, it's, it's, it's overweight. It's overweight small caps for sure. Overweight I was thinking small. maybe he was bringing up the large cap value exposure just to replace market weight and small, but 13% is over. Well, maybe not actually. That's probably about market cap weight when you look at, um, all the different small cap pieces like uh, value, nut neutral, and growth. But you sure have to be willing to accept tracking error if you're going to have a portfolio like that. And also, you know, deep dives in the value, I would think, like serious drawdowns to be able to handle that. So as long as serious you know that's drawing Yeah. Serious drawdowns. Yeah. So last question for you. Is there a specific reason Ben and Cameron are never talking about implementing the profitability factor within a portfolio with a dedicated ETF? I'm just going to say before I answer the question, it, it would be nice if we got some non-factor questions. <laughs> I mean, I guess we we chose the ones to answer. Um, yeah. Well, like, like we mentioned in the in the uh, introduction, we have the discussion up on the Rational Reminder site, and it's, <laughs> I mean, it's heavily factor factor oriented. These are the easy questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyways, what say you? Feel free to ask some. Uh, I don't know, financial planning questions or something next time. How much life insurance do I need or something like that? <laughs> uh, why don't we talk about profitability factor with ETFs? Well, if we found, and I think you did find one, Cameron, um, I, I didn't do any regression on it or anything, but if, if we found a profitability loaded ETF and stuck that into our portfolio that has uh, value and small cap value, we'd end up with something close to the market. We'd kind of kill all of our other weights. And the reason is when you're long value, when you're, when you're overweight value relative to the market, you're naturally short profitability because value stocks tend to be um, less, less profitable uh, relative to growth stocks. So by being long value, you're naturally short profitability. So if we go and stick, and then on the flip side, actually, profitability, your... Long profitability, uh, you'll be long growth. Your long growth, right. So if we take a value ETF on one side and go and mash it together with a profitability ETF on the other side, you're going to negate your value with the growth and the profitability. And well, and you're going to, yeah, you're going to end yep. up with um, something close to... The market so that that's really the reason you can't just go and take a profitability etf and mash it together um in that paper i did a while ago factor investing with etfs one of the things that i looked at was and, and this is due for a um a, a revisitation whatever you call it a, a new addition um because there are some new etfs in the market now but at, at that time the multi-factor etfs that were supposed to look at these things together i i didn't think that they had enough exposure to the factors relative to their fees to actually add any value. So I was like, at that point, you're just better off being market cap weighted or using the cheap, deep factor exposure ETFs that we were able to find for US stocks. Um, now, that doesn't mean profitability is useless. It's just like, if you take a profitability ETF and a value ETF and put them together, it's no good. If you take a value ETF and sort it for profitability and there overweight the most profitable value stocks, now that's good. Like, that's really good. That's better than just a regular value ETF. And that's what this whole multi-factor investing concept is about. Um, yeah, so there, there is a new, newer, not super new anymore, um, sort of late last year company that started launching products called Avantis. Uh, and it's actually interesting because their, their firm largely consists of people from Dimensional who left and they formed this new firm uh, that in a lot of ways mirrors the way that Dimensional is um, building products. Anyway, so we need to do more research on that firm. But one of the things that they are doing is what I just described, is looking at value uh, and also profitability, but together, not separately. Separately doesn't work. 
Um, one other interesting point on this is IJS, which is in the old, I'm going to call it old, even though we haven't released the new ones yet, the old Rational Reminder model portfolios, um, IJS does have pretty strong uh, and statistically significant exposure to the profitability factor. And the reason I think is that the, the way that S&P constructs that index, it's the S&P uh, 600 small cap value index, they have some pretty strict financial viability criteria that goes into their index construction. And so within the universe of small stocks, the ones that make it into that index, uh, I think end up giving it pretty significant, economically significant um, factor exposure. Interesting. Yeah. Not, not deliberate, but that's what they end up with. Yeah. And it's actually been, if you look at the rolling regressions over time for IGS, the profitability exposure has been remarkably consistent considering that they're not directly targeting it. Fascinating. So on to our main topic today. Yeah. Enough of the rapid fire factor yeah, investing the questions. Fire, this, <laughs> the unrapid fire questions. <laughs> Okay, so this next topic, I'm super pumped about this one. You've done a ton of work on this. This is a question that comes up all the time, all the time. If someone has a lump sum for whatever reason to invest, should I put it in now or should I pulse it in over time? I think the work you've done on this is phenomenal. I look forward to the video on this. The paper's coming out soon, but uh, go ahead, set it up. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you, you introduced it well, but just the, the, the concept of dollar cost averaging, I mean, this is a conversation we have with clients a lot, um, which is one of the reasons I wanted to write something about it. Uh, dollar cost averaging, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming people know, but I, I guess I won't assume because I'll explain it briefly. If you say you have a, a big chunk of cash, say you have a million dollars of cash that you got from whatever, an inheritance or the sale of a private business or something like that. So it's new new cash, new cash that has not been in the stock market previously. Or maybe you made a bunch of money on, on an individual stock, whatever. You got a million dollars, cash. Um, you can just invest it in the market. Or you can, well, try and time the market, I guess. <laughs> that's That's generally not a good idea. But there's kind of a middle ground where instead of just investing the full lump sum, you can do this thing called dollar cost averaging, which is systematically investing over a fixed period of time. So say you take your million dollars and split it up over whatever, 10 months, 12 months, whatever it is. Um, and I think the main idea with doing that is that you reduce the risk of investing at the worst possible time. It's basically regret avoidance. Yeah, right. Regret, regret avoidance is, right. a, is a pretty good way if, to... If the market collapses, which is what people are looking for, right? Oh, what if the market collapses? I'd be sick over having my million dollars go down to 900,000 in a couple months. Or less. It could go down to six or 500,000. Yeah. Like that That can happen too. And I think that's the, that's the part people are really worried about. Anyway, um, so you, you built the framework to take a look at how rationally things have turned out yeah so that i i started by building a model i just wrote some code in visual basic that allowed me to do to compare to really quickly compare dollar cost averaging to lump sum investing for a whole bunch of markets and a whole bunch of different time periods so i was kind of i started with that i wrote wrote the code and then i was like oh hey this is kind of cool i can compare dollar cost averaging to lump sum investing for any market really quickly um, so that gave me this big data set that I could play around with. And then I started trying to draw some insights out of it. And it all started actually just answering, um, a client question, like someone making this decision. Uh, so I started to try and gather the data around it and then started to realize it was actually kind of neat. So I, yeah, now, now it's paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I ended up doing, I, I evaluated dollar cost averaging versus lump sum investing over 10 year periods, rolling 10 year periods. Rolling means starting with the first month. So say the first month in the data set is January 1st, 1970, which it was for a, a lot of the um, index series that we used. So that's the, that's the first data point. So we look at the 10 years following that. And then the next rolling period is February, 1970. So you keep rolling forward uh, 10 year investment horizons and moving forward one month in the data with each step. Uh, for, for most of the data series, 
uh, I had 485. That's from 1970 uh, until April 2020, 485 10-year periods. For Canada, I had 652 periods. And for the US, I had 1,013 periods. Um, and I did a 12-month dollar cost averaging implementation. So taking a million dollars, although the dollar amount doesn't matter because I looked at everything in terms of um, returns, percentage returns, but whatever. In the model, I had a million dollars. And it was comparing investing that boom, day one, or month one, I guess, uh, versus dollar cost averaging 12 equal monthly investments. The cash, while it's waiting to be invested, was sitting in one month U.S. Uh, treasury bills. And then once everything's fully invested, it was invested 100% in stocks. No bonds in the in the fully implemented portfolio. So these are all in the different countries' indices. There's no balanced portfolio, correct? Correct. Yeah, so I did not do any balanced portfolio. It was each, but, each country individually. But then I did look at the equal weighted data for the combination of all the countries. Right. So there's not no a cap factor weighted. loading. There's nothing like that. No, no fixed just market income. cap weighted. Just, okay. These are all equity portfolios in a number of different countries. Yeah. So it's Australia, Canada, Germany, Japan, United Kingdom, and the United States. Right. And I picked those, I don't know, not, arbitrary is not the right word. I mean, Germany and Japan are economically large. So is the UK in terms of GDP and also market cap weight. And then Australia is somewhat similar to Canada in terms of their uh, market structure. So it wasn't a random choice. Uh, anyway, it's like, what data do I have available? And then which countries do I think are relevant? Um, so the evaluation point, like when we're talking about the relative performance of the two strategies, we're talking about the uh, ending performance, the ending, ending annualized performance difference after 10 years. Um, yeah. So the, the first thing that I did, and this is how it, it all started, was just look at the full data series. So for all these different countries, look at the whole data series and just look at what, what, are, the, what are the average outcomes. Uh, and then the other thing that I did that I thought was kind of interesting was I isolated the most extreme bad lump sum outcomes. So forgetting about how lump sum did relative to dollar cost averaging, just like let's, let's rank the lump sum outcomes by best to worst and take the worst ones and see if dollar cost averaging helped in those cases. So and then the that, worst cases for the 10 year period or for the one year investment period? 10 year. So the worst, the worst 10 year outcome. So we take all, all the lump sum, all the months that you could have invested in lump sum, rank those by best to worst, take the worst ones, and then see if dollar cost yeah. average could have helped. Because that, that's not, the concern isn't usually, um, am I going to get a bad outcome relative to dollar? I mean, I guess it inherently is. Am I going to get a bad outcome relative to dollar cost averaging? People are usually just thinking about a bad outcome from a yeah. lump sum perspective. Exactly. For sure. So that's why I sorted by um, lump sum. And then knowing that you can't predict when you're going to get a bad lump sum outcome, um, I perform similar analysis, but during bear markets, so after a 20% or greater drop in the stock market. And then again, similar analysis when stock prices have been high historically. And for that one, I just did US data because that's where I had the Schiller Cape going back to 1870, I think. Uh, okay, so that kind of sets up the analysis. Before getting into the results, I think it's worth pointing out just the nature of stock returns in general. Um, so the equity risk premium, and I for this piece, I just looked at U.S. data because there's so much of it. Um, the equity risk premium in the U.S. has been super consistent over the long term. Um, it's been the, an arith arithmetic average of 65 basis points going back to 1926. And it's been positive. Now, this is the equity risk premium that I'm talking about. So that's equities in excess of one month T-bills. It's been positive 60% of the time. In 60% of months, it's been positive. Now, there do tend to be these volatility clustering periods where volatility would increase a whole bunch for a period of time, and then it settles back down. Uh, and I, I made a chart that I'll put in the paper on this. Uh, and you can see it. Like You can see this band of returns that's pretty consistent over time. But then every now and then, there's a bunch of um, a bunch of observations way above and below this sort of normal, normal operating band. Um, now, given that though, that stock, stock returns are positive in roughly 60%, the risk premium equity risk premium is positive roughly 60% of months. You'd, you'd expect an investor randomly choosing a month 
um, to get a positive outcome about 60% of the time. Um, now, for the, for the rest of the paper, we're not referring to the equity risk premium. Uh, we're, we're just looking at the absolute returns of dollar cost averaging relative to lump sum investing. And when you look at that data point for U.S. stock returns, um, stock returns, just in absolute terms, have been positive 63% of the time in the U.S. data. Okay, so now into the actual analysis. <laughs> the tease is over? Yeah. Well, I had to set it up. Can't just start talking about the results. Uh, so for, for most markets, um, most with the exception really being Japan and sort of Australia, uh, but we can kind of generalize and say that for uh, most markets, about two thirds of the time, and this is the same as like Vanguard did a paper on this a while ago in 2011, I think, and they found similar results for similar countries, although not as many countries as I looked at. So roughly two thirds of the time, lump sum investing beats dollar cost averaging over 10 year periods. So like, no That's just in there. general, in general. Yeah, I'm rolling. over the full data set. Now Japan's the worst of the bunch with 57% lump sum beating dollar cost averaging. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to include Japan. Um, because we kind of know what path their, their stock market's taken. But since the 1990s, Japan, Japanese stocks have trailed one month U.S. Treasury bills. And keep in mind, that's that's the asset that we're holding our cash in while we're do dollar cost averaging. Right. So Japan, 57%. But you go through the numbers, and I know some people are giving feedback that don't like hearing numbers in the podcast, but sorry, I have to say the numbers. <laughs> um, I'll say them slowly. So in Australia, it was 61.86% of the time. In Canada, 66%. Germany, 65%. Japan, 57 like I said. United Kingdom, 68% of the time. And in the U.S., 70.6% of the time, lump sum investing beat dollar cost averaging over 10-year periods. And if we take an equal weighted average of those, that's 65% of the time. So two-thirds of the time, you could expect lump sum, or not expect, in the past, lump sum beat dollar cost averaging. Yeah, I mean, I think you can say expect, though, because I think that's consistent with expected stock returns. Right. Like the expected risk premium should be fairly consistent over time, um, especially in a diversified portfolio, globally diversified portfolio. Uh, so, again, no surprise there. Lump sum investing beats dollar cost averaging. Um, but the, 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 the full sample, actually, no, one more point on the full sample before I move on. So the, the, to quantify it, so not just the percentage of the percent of the time, what does the distribution of outcomes actually look like? Uh, the, the annualized 10 year performance difference on average, this is an equal weighted average across all the markets was 38 basis points. So across all of the samples historically for all the markets that we looked at, you're leaving 38 basis points annualized on the table over 10 years on average so by dollar cost averaging. So implicit cost of dollar cost average is 0.38%. Correct. Now this also presumes you're going to behave properly and hold on for the 10 years if things don't happen to have gone the way you had hoped. Oh yeah, and we're going to come back to that piece later because I think that's a really important part of this whole this whole thing. Um, that that implicit cost was really consistent, which was fascinating across all the markets. In Australia, it was 32 basis points, 37 in Canada, 38 in Germany, 39 in Japan, 40 in the UK and 41 in the US. So equal weighted average of 38 basis points. But it's fascinating how close they are uh, across across all the different markets. Um, okay, so then the next thing that I looked at is the percentiles. So just to try and get a feel for the shape of the dis distribution of outcomes. Um, now remember that equal weighted average, that performance difference was 38 basis points. And that's important because that's a mean and we're going to talk about the median in a second, uh, which is important in thinking about the distribution of outcomes. Um, so in the 10th percentile, which is the bottom 10% of outcomes, I, we looked at the 50th percentile, which is the median, like I just said, and then the 90th percentile, which is the top 10%. Now, the, the median in all of the observations is greater than the mean, which means that this data series has a negative skew, which is characteristic of stock returns in general. And what a negative skew means for all the people that have to go and look that up, um, 
including me, because I always get positive and negative skew confused, even though I've seen the, <laughs> I've seen the term so many times. Um, negative skew means that there are more, more frequent and smaller gains and fewer, but more extreme losses, which is, again, that is, that is what stock returns stock, the distribution of stock returns tends to look like. So nothing, uh, nothing new or exciting there. The dollar cost averaging lump sum investing outcome are just mat matching the distribution of stock returns, which you'd expect. Now it is interesting when you look at the 10th and the 90th percentile. So the worst 10% and the best 10%. Of outcomes, the best ten percent are better um, relative to the median than the worst ten percent are worse. Now that might sound weird because we just described this as a negatively skewed distribution. When you look further in the tails, like if we go out to the first percentile and the ninety ninth percentile, then you start to see that negative skew show up. But that also speaks to how rare those extreme negative outcomes are. You really have to start digging in the in the extreme tales. As I was preparing these notes for this discussion, I was actually thinking about this. It's almost like that that cost, that implied cost of thirty eight basis points. It's almost like a, it's a really expensive insurance policy against getting that deep left tail outcome. It's a really unlikely outcome, but it can happen. And the worst, the the far left tail outcomes are worse than the far right tail outcomes are good. But there are more outcomes, uh, more more pretty good outcomes in the right tail than pretty bad outcomes in the left tail. But in deep, deep, deep left tail, you've got more to lose than you have to gain in the far right tail. Which you go back to the behavioral part of all of this, we know that people don't like losses much more than they like gains. So are you implying that that extreme event for a certain personality it may warrant doing dollar cost average versus lump sum i don't know about that because that that person is going to be risk averse relative to the amount of money that they had they're not going to be risk averse relative to how they would have done in dollar cost averaging this is one of the other really interesting observations that i made is that the very worst so right now we're talking about the worst outcomes in terms of the difference between lump sum investing and dollar cost averaging we're not talking about the worst lump sum case. And that's an interesting distinction because the very worst lump sum um, outcome relative to dollar cost averaging was not the very worst lump sum outcome. Fascinating. Right. This and that, is the and differential. It, this is the differential between the two. So it still could have been a positive experience. And it, and it was. Uh, no, it was, uh, it, was a, it was in 1931. Um, and it, was, it wasn't a great outcome. I think it was a negative... Yeah, 1931 it must have been. It was a negative annualized return, whether you were uh, lump sum or dollar cost. Fascinating. Average. Um, but in that case, actually, I think you got, you, you ended up with a really, uh, you ended up with a really bad outcome from, uh, hold on, I'm, I got to look at it now. I was looking at this before we started talking, but then I, I put it away. So if we compare, okay, so the, the annualized return, okay, yeah, so this is fascinating. So this is the, the, the very worst outcome in the whole distribution. Now, this is for U.S. data only that, that I'm talking about. Um, so the, the worst difference in outcomes in terms of annualized returns was negative 6.18% in favor of dollar cost averaging. And that was for the 10-year period starting September 1931. That's the biggest delta between the two. The biggest delta. Now, Not the worst outcome for dollar correct. cost averaging. So your your lump sum annualized return over that period was three point five three percent annualized. Not not terrible considering the time period that we're talking about. But this this part's fascinating. So the dollar cost averaging annualized return nine point seven two percent. So it's not like you were you were avoiding a horrible left tail outcome um, in, in lump sum terms. You were, you were just kind of missing out on what just happened to be a really, really good time to be dollar cost averaging. Yep. And then you think about like the path dependence of, of the outcome starting in September, 1931, you probably just ended up investing at a bunch of bottoms, <laughs> like market bottoms before, because there's so much volatility over the time period. And that month just happened to be the month uh -oh. where you, you ended up with a really good outcome. So volatility luck at the start of that period has the impact. Fascinating. I mean, here's another, here's another fascinating one. 
uh, June 2008. Okay, this is the uh, ninth, eighth worst outcome in terms of the differential between lump sum and dollar cost averaging. So it was a negative 3.71% annualized. Starting when in 08? Uh, June. So just as the crisis was getting going. Um, so big, big differential in terms of annualized return. But in lump sum terms, you made 9.47% annualized. If you dollar cost averaged, you made 12.96%. But again, wow. we come back to the idea that you're not avoiding some horrible outcome. Right. You just kind of, it's like, yeah, dollar cost averaging would have been way better. But to speak to your point about the behavior, uh, it's not like you're, you're losing a bunch of money in lump sum terms. It's just you didn't get as good of an outcome as you right. would have. Anyway, so and, no, and keep in mind also, these are the deep, deep tails. Yeah. Most of the outcomes favor lump sum. We have to dig to the worst handful uh, to find the, the cases where uh, uh, dollar cost averaging is, is like way better. Uh, okay. We went into a little bit of a, dig a digression. So now you're going to push it to the worst lump sum investment periods? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. So I'll, uh, just on, on, the, on the far left tail piece, and on the left tail being more extreme than the right tail, so that's that negatively skewed distribution, I think when people think about dollar cost averaging, that's what they're thinking about. Like I, I, the people don't want that far left tail outcome, but I think the, the frequency of that outcome is so low relative to how much more frequent the, the good outcomes are, even if the good outcomes aren't quite as extreme. I mean, hold on. I didn't expect to, I hope people don't mind that we're like talking about the data points because they can't see what we're looking at, obviously, but the other thing that'd be cool to look at is in those extreme tales what the behavior, I know I keep coming back to this, but what was going on in the markets and that might have caused someone to bail? Did you think about 2008, June of 2008? You had to have been able to hold on all the way through late 2008, early 2009 before things turned around in March of 2009. Yeah. Okay, here. So I had a, I had a histogram that I made up that I'll, I'll put this in the paper that I do to write up this whole experiment too. But the... So the far left tail is uh, is a bucket of negative uh, three point six six percent to negative four point zero eight percent, and there and this is the delta again. This is the difference between um, dollar cost averaging and lump sum. Uh, and there are five five data points in that bucket, and then you look at the far right tail, and it's three point zero six to three point four eight percent. So again, you see that skew, right? Like you see that those worst, worst outcomes for dollar cost averaging are worse than at the other end of the distribution, um, then lump sum is better than dollar cost averaging. And so I, I, like I said, I think that's what people are worried about. People are worried about getting that deep left tail, knowing that the far right tail isn't quite as good. Like there's not quite as much to gain if you get the best possible timing by doing a lump sum um, as there is to lose if you get the worst possible outcome. But I don't think that accounts for the frequency of good outcomes relative to bad outcomes. Like you're much more likely to get the good outcomes, even if the worst outcome is worse. It's it's so unlikely that you're actually going to get that. So that's why I said earlier that I think this ends up being, it's like insurance. You're, you're, you're probably way overpaying for insurance against that really unlikely bad outcome if you go the dollar cost averaging route. Because so, so frequently in the historical distribution of outcomes, you've been worse off um, by dollar cost averaging. Okay. Anyway, but I, I did think that that, that tail, that, that negative skew piece did give some validation to the whole concept of dollar cost averaging to avoid the worst outcome. Like, sure, it can do that, but you're just way more likely to actually make yourself worse off by trying to avoid that extreme bad outcome. Okay. So the next thing I looked at was forget about the, forget about the, 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 the difference in outcomes for a second. Like just now we were talking about the shape of the distribution in terms of the difference in outcomes between dollar cost averaging and lump sum investing. Let's just look at lump sum investing, sort by outcome, take the worst 10% of lump sum outcomes and see how dollar cost averaging did in those cases. So if people thought, okay, I'm about to invest this, this lump sum of new money and I'm really worried about getting a bad outcome, okay, would dollar cost averaging make you better off if it does end up being a bad time to do a lump sum? 
would it have saved you in the worst periods for lump sum investing? Not is it randomly going to be the best time ever to do it dollar cost averaging, which is kind of no. what we were talking about a second ago. And I do think that's just random outcomes. Like if you happen to invest this, you end up with like naive, perfect market timing in some historical cases. But if we forget about that and just say, okay, we, we, we're pretty sure we're going to have a bad lump sum outcome. So let's dollar cost average. Would that actually have helped you? Um, and I found that in 51.41% of historical periods, lump sum investing would have made you better off. That's just in terms of the number of outcomes. If we take into account the the magnitude of it's kind of like the shape of the distribution that we were just talking about, how, how good were the good outcomes relative to how bad were the bad outcomes, the annualized return difference was negative 29 basis points. So this dollar the, cost averaging. These are the worst 10% of lump sum investing in your data set. Correct. So if we think about forward looking, this is if we could predict. Yep. The worst outcomes would dollar cost averaging have, have made you better off. So, so half fifty one percent. Yeah, roughly half the time it would have, and and on average it was a twenty nine basis point advantage for dollar cost averaging. So I thought that was pretty interesting too. Now obviously we cannot predict the thing I just said. We cannot predict um, what are going to be the worst future lump sum outcomes. Um. So, okay. it, it, so instead not, of that's just not screamingly compelling, it's not compelling. Oh, because we can't actually predict. Well, that, no, it's right? not compelling that dollar cost average is going to save you. Yeah, yeah, it's a kind, it's a bit of a toss up. Yeah, that, that you're right. It, th this is this is this is not a real. It's it's not a good reflection of reality because we've intentionally picked the worst right. lump sum outcomes, and even then, it was a toss up. Right, or roughly a a, a toss up. Uh, the distribution of outcomes, though, and you kind of see this from uh, that negative mean return difference, the negative 29 basis points, uh, the, the distribution was much more negatively skewed this time. So the worst outcomes were worse than the best outcomes were better. Right. But again, we've, we, we looked back in time and picked the worst possible uh, lump sum outcomes. Okay, so then I thought, well, obviously, like what you just said, Cameron, this is not reality because we don't know if we're going to get the worst lump sum outcome or not. So what can we, what, 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 what do people think we can use to predict bad investment outcomes? So I figured there are two things. There were two things that people worry, during which period, periods people worry about this the most, which is bear markets, like we just saw, um, and bull markets. <laughs> Yeah, and, and bull markets. Bull markets. <laughs> You're right. And when stock prices are high. So for bear markets, I just said, uh, we're, we're only going to look at months, starting months, where the market has dropped by 20% or more in the previous month. So, so serious market, drop. 20% okay. or more. Yeah. Um, so it's like, okay, we're deciding to invest this million dollars of cash the market just dropped twenty percent. Does it make sense to dollar cost average now because we're in this these uncertain times, as they're often called? So did dollar cost averaging protect you? It, on average, it did not protect you, uh, which was interesting. So same thing: twelve month deployment of the cash after a twenty percent drop has already happened. Um, equal weighted average across all the markets. Yeah, uh, fifty three point six six percent of the time, lump sum investing made you better off over the full period across all the markets. It was fifty percent or greater, except for the UK, and I had to like triple check the data on this one because it didn't make sense that it was so different. But thirty three percent of the time only, lump sum investing made you better off in that market. Yeah, but the rest of the markets, Canada, yeah. like there's another like, outlier. Uh, yeah, I double checked that data too, but Canada was seventy eight point five seven percent of the time, lump sum made you better off. Um, but you kind of think about practically like what happens when the market drops 20%? Well, sometimes, kind of rarely, it drops more. Like you get a 20% drop and then another 20% drop. More often, historically anyway, you get a 20% drop and then you get a recovery. And that shows up in this data. M more often you're ending up with a... Um, it, the, the the negative 20% and ending up being actually not the worst time to invest. 
Um, so the, the average annualized return difference in this case was 25 basis points in favor of lump sum investing. And it's also worth, worth mentioning, I think, that the U.S. outcome, which was 50% of the time, um, lump sum was better. Not, not that we should eliminate this part of the data, but that's heavily skewed by the 1930s, where it was like every 20% drop was followed by another 20% drop um, for that whole that whole time period. So in, in bear markets, is it different? It's a little bit different. It's a little bit more of a toss-up relative to the full data set. And that's consistent with something that um, Gerard O'Reilly, Dimensional CEO, said in a, in a webcast I listened to recently, that the equity, equity premium, well, it's kind of like what I mentioned earlier too with the distribution of stock returns. The equity premium is remarkably consistent over time, um, except for sometimes. <laughs> and I think Gerard's data point was that I don't remember the exact numbers, but around market declines, the premium tends to be significantly negative. Um, and then it tends to be significantly positive, like more so than usual. And then it just kind of goes back to normal. So I think this to an extent shows up in, uh, in these data too. Okay. So bear markets, still no clear advantage for dollar cost averaging. Uh, and then the last one I looked at was when stock prices are high. And this one was was also, this is probably my favorite one to look at, I think, just in terms of going through the data. Um, yeah, so I mean, basically, when, when stock prices fall, everyone's panicking about investing. But when stock prices, when they rise, everyone's also panicking about investing new money because there's always a worry about investing at a peak. Um, so I took shiller cape ratio data and used that to measure at a point in time, how expensive or cheap the U.S. market was relative to history. And I only looked at observations where the Schiller Cape was in the 95th percentile of all historical monthly observations. So I took all of the Schiller Cape data from 1872 to, from February 1872 to May 2020. And if a given month fell within the 95th percentile of historical Schiller Cape over that full time period, then we looked at that month and we went through the whole data set and did that. So with that sort of expensiveness, um, lump sum investing beats dollar cost averaging 54.24% of the time with an average annualized return difference of only three basis points. So it makes lump sum investing look not that great, especially considering those deep left tail outcomes that we were talking about. So people might be thinking, well, maybe Maybe not such a good idea. Maybe not worth it. Three basis points annualized return difference in the U.S. data series anyway, when stock markets are expensive or when the stock market is expensive. But that that observation, um, and I took this concept from an old AQR paper. But that observation doesn't it doesn't not it does not reflect reality because I used all of the Schiller Cape data for the history of the U.S. stock market to determine whether any given data point was expensive or cheap. But if we're in, you know, uh, 1960, we didn't know what the Schiller Cape was going to be from 1960 through 2020. So I went back and did the correction that AQR did in the paper that made me think of this and redid, redid the exact same analysis. But to determine whether the market was cheap or expensive, I only looked at backward looking Schiller Cape data at each month. Um, so like if we're saying January 26th where the data series starts, we're comparing um, we're comparing the Schiller Cape on that date to the set of, of Schiller Cape data from 19, 1872 to January 1926, not from February 1872 to May 2020. So it eliminates that, whatever you'd call that, um, backward looking bias. With that correction, uh, lump sum investing beats dollar cost averaging 64% of the time. Wow. Yeah, big deal. That's a little uh, bit more compelling. Yeah, and this is still the 95th percentile. So you as the investor sitting there making the decision, looking at the historical data, and the market's at its 95th percentile of historical expensiveness, uh, is still pretty pretty good shot of outperforming with the lump sum. Amazing. And the average annualized return difference in that case, 18 basis points. It's crazy, eh? Even at the 95th percentile, the Shiller yeah. Cape, it's still not compelling to dollar cost average. Well, wait till you hear this one. 
the next one, the, the little, this, this one didn't have the same rigor in the analysis because I didn't have the data, but I looked at Japan just out of interest because I, I was doing the U S analysis and I'm thinking like, man, I wonder what it looks like in Japan. I bet it's, I bet it's fascinating. And it was, um, so I, like I mentioned, I, I don't have Schiller cave data for Japan going back to, I don't know what it was like 1940 or something to do a similar analysis. Um, so instead I just used the most expensive that the U S market's ever been as the benchmark to determine whether or not the Japanese market was expensive. Um, so that the, the highest that the monthly Schiller cape has ever been in the U S data, uh, was 44.19, which happened in December, 1999. Japan, as some people may know, got really expensive in the eighties up until 1990. So in, in May, 1986, Japan had a Schiller Cape of 44.31. So it exceeded the sort of tech bubble levels of the US and then it kept going up. Now, the Japanese market did decline significantly. And, and like we mentioned at the beginning of this discussion, it didn't really, it hasn't really recovered uh, even, even now. Um, but so following May, 1986 with a Schiller Cape of 44.31, there were 29 observations after that where lump sum investing beat dollar cost averaging by a pretty significant margin too. And I pulled this, this, I thought this one was fascinating. So in November, 1988, when the Schiller Cape was 72.07, lump sum still beat dollar cost averaging wow. in that month in terms of 10 year annualized returns. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the returns may not have been great at the end of it, but still lump sum beat dollar cost averaging. Yeah, the, the return you're looking at the relative, you're not looking at the returns, like a relative. Correct. Yeah. And, but, but the, 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 front end of that, I mean, I've looked at Japan, wow. I've looked at Japan on this in the past too, of, um, cause people say, well, if you invested in Japan in 1990, you know, you lost a, a ton of money and, and never made it back, which is true. But even if you invested in Japan in like, I, I haven't looked at the data in a while, but say you started investing in Japan in 1980 and just held until now your annualized returns are like around 6%. And that's because the returns from 1980 to 1990 were so high that even with 30 years of flat returns afterwards, you actually still got a pretty good outcome if you just held on to Japanese stocks. But that kind of speaks to this too, where, where prices can keep going up, even if you don't expect them to. Um, yeah, so it is, it is known that when prices are high, future expected returns are lower. But based on this, you can't use that to time the dollar cost averaging versus lump sum investing decision or the, the, I mean, the market timing decision in general. Uh, okay. So that, that, that was, that, that was it. That was the analysis. So bottom um, line, it's not compelling to dollar cost average. Yeah. I mean, the psychological the risk point. piece is, is big. Like you, you mentioned that Cameron, if you're going to bail on the lump sum strategy, then that's no good. But I was thinking about that as I was writing this and it's like, if, if you're investing in a portfolio that is so scary that you feel the need to dollar cost average, maybe that's not an appropriate portfolio. Exactly. I was thinking a lot about this. Like the data are so obviously in favor of lump sum investing, no matter how you slice it up. So it's like, I don't know, you know, if you're, if you're not comfortable doing a lump sum, and to, to make a portfolio palatable, if you have to dollar cost average with, with new money, I don't, I'm not saying people should never dollar cost average. And like, this is, like I said before, a conversation we have with clients all the time. And, um, we didn't have the data to this extent, but we've always had the data that lump sum tends to be better and clients still do dollar cost average in, but I, I don't know, like this, 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 I wouldn't say it changed my mind, but it gave me more appreciation for how unlikely it is the dollar cost averaging is going to do anything special for you. Exactly. So on to the planning topic. Yeah. We'll do this quickly because I know we're running a little bit longer, but it's worth it. So I thought Alexandra McQueen, our good friend, Alexandra McQueen, and she's at Money Gal on Twitter. She wrote a great article in the April 28th episode or, or publication of Money Sense. Just wondering what the impact of the pandemic might be on retirement planning. And she highlighted what she thought were three potential fallouts from this pandemic. And I think makes pretty good sense to me. Number one, uh, the movement towards early retirement, she believes will dwindle as employment security drops. And to me, that makes sense. Uh, 
I mean, you can see a scenario where housing prices fall, markets fall, potentially lower returns, less money, and fewer jobs to fall back on is her main point. I guess there's a lot of people that do retire knowing that, well, if things don't go as they had hoped, they can always go back to work. Well, her argument is more people may hang on to their jobs longer, build in a bigger cushion to make sure they're really certain that they'll be okay in retirement. Hmm. So that seems sensible to me. Yeah. Another stat, and this I thought was interesting, the amount of debt carried by retirees will reduce. Even though she says seniors' debt load has increased, and can you believe this? Mortgage debt for seniors has doubled since 1999. Wow. And consumer debt for seniors is up 50% since 2016. I wasn't aware of that. Uh, but the belief that weak markets and general, you know, worry about things will cause people to reduce debt and that we're hearing from lots of people now will cause them to use current cash to pay off current debt and then also take on less debt. So she thinks people will become more conservative generally in their spending and put more of their disposable cash flow towards debt reduction. And her last uh, proposal, I guess you could call it, is the appeal of guaranteed income will rise. And this is what we talked about her when she was on with us last summer about annuities. So she thinks there'll be much more interest in annuities, be a lot more respect for old age security, Canada pension plan. And it's also in interesting to note, she noted this, that how the Spanish flu of 1918 actually helped shape the life insurance business in North America. So she's saying, well, maybe COVID-19 will actually increase the interest in the annuity business. Seems a little pretty sensible to me. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I think, I mean, we had chatted earlier this week about, you know, some articles that Moja Malewski had put on to Twitter. So I took a look at an article called COVID-19 Longevity Risk and the Economics of Annuitization. So this year during the pandemic, there has been a spike in life insurance applications, which is exactly what happened after the Spanish flu. So the question Professor Malewski asked in this article was, how should the annuity industry continue to justify and encourage longevity insurance? When you think about it, and we talked about life expectancy a few episodes ago, you know, the result of a pandemic is that life expectancy can drop. So how does the industry increase the appeal, going back to Alexandra's point, of guaranteed income and protecting yourself with income if you happen to live a long time in a period where life expectancy may be falling? It's a pretty good question. So here I'm going to quote him. He says, here's my main idea. Counterintuitively, the magnitude of longevity risk, which technically is a coefficient of variation of your remaining life, actually increases as mortality rates spike. How's that for counterintuitive? Moreover, if episodes of COVID-19 are now part of the new non-normal, then over the foreseeable future, longevity risk will be higher rather than lower. Ergo, annuities will become even more important going forward. Longevity risk is not that you might live a long time. Rather, it's about the uncertainty around that expectation. Yeah, he calls how's, it the second, the second moment. How's that for a head spinner? Yeah. So I, I, I read through his post and tried to figure out what he meant <laughs> by, by that piece. Um, and he actually laid it out pretty clearly, as I guess you'd expect from him. Uh, so the, 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 co the coefficient of variation of remaining life is the standard deviation of life expectancy divided by the life expectancy. So that number, the coefficient of variation on remaining life, is the measure for longevity risk. And he said, pension, this is what pension plan sponsors and I'm assuming annuity providers are looking at. And then he explains that a mortality shock reduces life expectancy and the standard deviation of life expectancy, but the standard deviation of life expectancy falls less. And so, so the I'm, ratio. Yeah, keep going. The ratio actually goes up. So I, the numbers that he had in his post, I think, were, if I still have it open, uh, yeah. So in, in normal times, the coefficient of variation for a 65-year-old is 45.3%. With a 60% mortality shock, so mortality 60% above normal, uh, the coefficient of variation increases to 51.1%. 
And that's because life expectancy has decreased from, in his example, 20.11 years in normal times to 15.56 years in the 60% mortality shock time. Uh, and the standard deviation has gone from 9.11 to 7.95. So because of that, the coefficient of variation goes up. So that measure of mortality or longevity risk is actually increasing. So yeah, the odds of living longer have declined, but life is riskier. So that makes annuities more valuable from an economic standpoint. Yeah, definitely counterintuitive, but also fascinating. So his point is, what can the industry do to make that argument more compelling? I mean, Alexander's argument is pretty straightforward, right? More certainty, but if life expectancy is less, anyways, there's the answer. But I guess you'd expect it to be reflected in, and he mentions pricing in, in the article, but you'd expect that to be reflected in, in annuity pricing. Like if, if mortality, if life expectancy is shorter, uh, you'd expect, yeah, geez, I guess you'd expect the price <laughs> to come down to reflect lower mortality, but, but you'd also expect it to go up a little bit because longevity risk is higher, I guess. But net, would you expect a, a, a reduction in cost? I think on net, you'd expect a reduction in cost. But he also shows the, and I, I don't fully understand all the economics behind this. Um, I, I think he's teaching like PhD economic, PhD level economics, um, which I have never taken, <laughs> PhD level anything. Um, but he, he, there's, there's one me measure he shows, the, the annuity equivalent wealth. Um, and that's that, that number is going up. Anyway, I, I don't know how this affects annuity pricing, but it just from an economic perspective, the value of the annuity is increasing to the annuity holder. Exactly. Which is fascinating and super counterintuitive. And hopefully we can have him on to explain this to everybody yeah. one day. Yeah, he'd explain it better than we can. That's a given. Anyways, bad advice of the week. Quickly to round this out. Article from Barron's called, It's a Weird Market, Time to Go Active. So you knew as soon as I saw that title, it was going to be making the bad <laughs> advice of the week. Anyways, it was an interesting article. They interviewed a number of index advisors who are now adding in active managers. Oh, <laughs> what? Did you pull this from Twitter? Uh, yeah. Where else? I saw. I still? saw. I saw the tweet, and the, the tweet said something along the lines of like, "Can can you imagine working with someone who's giving you financial advi advice based on evidence and data, and then all of a sudden they change their they change their tune and decide to start adding in?" Oh, some of the quotes funds. are unbelievable. Anyway, the quote from the article says, "Some of financial advisors, including longtime skeptics of active management, are moving." money into these active strategies. Quote, they believe that the market is acting irrationally enough to give good managers the chance of beating the benchmarks. It makes sense to be surgical now more than ever, said one CEO of a financial investment group. You need to find companies gaining market share, even if their prices are going down. Another advisor says the markets were overbought and there is, get this, Ben, there is no cerebral cortex to a passive approach. Wow. Wow. And the article mentioned 2000 bubble as a time where 70% of active managers beat passive counterparts. It was a turkey shoot, says a global director of research at Morningstar. Wait, is that true? No, it's not. Yeah, I'm just reporting the article. I'm not going to refute it right now, but I'm not sure that's true. Maybe for a month or something when the, like, <laughs> because they were holding cash or something. I don't know. Anyways, hasn't been the experience so far this year. 48% beating their benchmark through the recent V-shaped market. Anyways, get this. Some are nibbling. They're choosing concentrated portfolios. So the manager has the agility and flexibility to dodge, to dodge risks and snap up opportunities. Can you imagine people moving to an active portfolio for this reason? Based on feeling? Like you well, feel I mean, they're going to dodge? A lot of uncertainty and fear, and, and it's it's not necessarily easy to have an appreciation for the data on active management or or the theory behind why it shouldn't make a whole lot of sense. So I I mean I I get it. Uncertainty goes up. People start doing weird stuff. I wouldn't call it surprising. Anyways, the article did mention at the end that there the evidence suggests that it is tough to predict which manager will perform, but that fees do matter. So it did finish well, on balance. Ken Ken French said it. 
perfectly in, in the last episode where we had him on as a guest. And he, he talked about something along the lines of he, he doesn't doubt that there are good active managers out there that can produce pretty good results before fees. But who's that benefit accruing to them or the, or the clients? It's going to accrue to the manager. That's right. And that shows up in the data. And you can't really argue with the data. Anything else to add today? Nope. All right. Thanks for listening.